Hi, and welcome to Recovery Resources. Today's training is on universal precautions and bloodborne pathogens. This training is presented by your Human Resources Department. Today, we will learn about hazards associated with human blood and will go over ways to minimize or limit your exposure to such hazards. This presentation applies to anybody working at Recovery Resources, such as medical staff, therapists, administration, including senior staff, intake, reception, employment and vocational staff, and human resources. Let's go over some definitions. Bloodborne pathogens are small organisms such as viruses and bacteria that can cause disease. Bloodborne pathogens pass from one person to another through infected materials such as blood and body fluids. Hepatitis B and HIV are two of the viruses in human blood that can cause illness or death. Contamination is the presence of blood or other potentially infectious materials. Decontamination is using physical or chemical means to remove, destroy, or render safe potentially infectious materials. There are four ways to spread these germs, the first being airborne or respiratory route. These germs are spread when infected droplets from the nose, lungs, sinuses, throat, or contaminated tissues or fabric are inhaled when we breathe. Examples of things transmitted this way are tuberculosis, colds, and chickenpox. Another way to spread germs occurs through direct contact. This occurs by directly touching an infected area or body fluid such as saliva, mucus, eye discharge, pus, or spit. Examples of things transmitted this way are conjunctivitis, impetigo, poison ivy, lice, or chicken pox. The third way to spread germs is the fecal-oral route. Germs entered the body from hands, food, mouth, toys, toilets, or diapers which have been unintentionally infected with germs from stool. Some things spread this way include hand, foot, and mouth disease, hepatitis A, or rotavirus. The fourth way to spread germs is through blood contact. The individual must come in contact with infected blood or body fluids. Some things spread this way are HIV AIDS, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. Other potentially infectious materials are human body fluids such as saliva, semen, vaginal secretions, and many other body fluids including, but not limited to, cerebrospinal fluid, amniotic fluid. Keep in mind that any body fluid visibly contained with blood may be infectious, and when in doubt, if you cannot tell that they are contaminated, treat every body fluid as if it is contaminated and infectious. Some bloodborne hazards that we will talk about include hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, or the human immunodeficiency virus. There are other bloodborne hazards such as malaria and syphilis. Hepatitis B is one of the most common viruses. There is a vaccine to prevent infection and it is now a routine vaccine. HBV can be easily spread to family members and to coworkers. This virus can stay alive in dry blood for, believe it or not, from seven to up to 10 days. If infected, you may feel like you have flu-like symptoms such as weakness, fatigue, loss of appetite, and or nausea, but your symptoms may be delayed for anywhere from 28 to 160 days. HBV usually begins with jaundice, which is a yellowing of the skin and eyes, and urine may darken, which indicates damage to the liver, and all of this can lead to death. Hepatitis B infected individuals may show no symptoms and are known as chronic carriers capable of transmitting the disease to others. Another common virus is hepatitis C. There is no vaccine available to prevent infection. HCV can be spread through sexual contact, IV drug use, from infected mother to child, and through blood-to-blood -blood contact. The signs and symptoms are close to that of hepatitis B, which were weakness, fatigue, loss of appetite, and or nausea. There is an incubation period of one to 12 weeks after exposure that may not report a positive result. Another very serious bloodborne disease is HIV. There is no vaccine for HIV. 
However, HIV cannot stay alive in dried blood as HBV can. It is difficult to contract in the workplace as this virus is not spread through casual contacts such as hugging, sharing food, utensils, clothing, bed linens, shaking hands, sharing a restroom, or mosquitoes. The point is it, impo it is impossible to spread this disease through casual contact. If, however, you do have HIV, you may feel like you have severe flu-like symptoms, but the symptoms can be delayed for months or even years. HIV decreases the body's ability to fight infection, and it attacks the immune system, and this can lead to acquired immune deficiency syndrome, or AIDS. There are many ways that these diseases can be transmitted. Bloodborne pathogens can be transmitted by entering your system through open sores, cuts, abrasions, acne, or any sort of damaged or broken skin, including sunburn or blisters. These germs can also be transmitted through mucous membranes such as the eyes, nose, and mouth. Let's talk about how such exposure occurs. The most common way is through needle sticks. It is estimated that between 600,000 and 800,000 needle stick injuries occur each year in the United States. Contaminated sharps means any contaminated object that can penetrate the skin, including, but not limited to, needles, scalpels, broken glass, broken capillary tubes, and the exposed ends of dental wires. Other forms of exposure are contacts of the mucous membrane, such as the eyes, nose, or mouth. Last but not least is something that we thankfully don't run into too often at Recovery Resources, and that's the cleaning up of spills, of infectious biohazard materials or fluids. Personal protective equipment includes things such as gowns, masks, lab coats, aprons, eye protection, face shields, gloves, or resuscitation devices. Personal protective equipment may prevent blood or other potentially infectious materials from passing through to or contacting your clothes, skin, eyes, mouth, or other mucous membranes. This barrier must remain intact under normal conditions of use and for the entire time it is in use. Personal protective equipment must be provided in the workplace in the appropriate sizes and at accessible locations. Under no circumstances is the employee to take personal protective equipment home. It must be placed in an appropriate designated area for disposal. As mentioned before, protective equipment includes gowns, lab coats, aprons, masks, eye protection, face shield, gloves, or resuscitation devices. Some of the most important things here are gloves. At a minimum, gloves must be used where there is a reasonable anticipation of hand contact with blood or other potentially infectious materials. Hypoallergenic gloves, glove liners, powderless gloves, or other alternatives must be provided for employees who are allergic to the gloves normally provided, so please inform us if this is a problem. Single-used gloves must be replaced as soon as possible when contaminated or as soon as feasible if torn, punctured, or otherwise not fully protected. They may not be washed or decontaminated for reuse. There are many methods of control to decrease or eliminate your exposure to infectious materials. Some examples of engineering controls that may be used to reduce exposure to blood or potentially infectious materials include self-sheathing needles, puncture-resistant containers for disposal of contaminated sharps, and resuscitation bags and ventilation devices. We also have work practice controls such as hand washing or restricting eating and drinking in areas where contaminated materials may be and also decontamination equipment. One of the most important things here would be hand washing. We recommend using liquid soap, warm running water, running all surfaces of the hands including thumbs, wrist, backs of the hands, between fingers, and around all nails for at least 30 seconds. You must rinse your hands well, dry your hands, and then turn off the faucet with a towel. Remember that antiseptic hand cleansers do not replace hand washing. Wash hands before and after care, especially during your analysis. Remember that controls are limited to the extent that they are properly used. Needle covers, safe needle devices, sharps containers are examples of controls that protect you from exposures such as hand washing as well but they only work when used according to your company procedures or when they are used, period. Now we'll discuss universal precautions. The universal precaution is to treat all human blood and bodily fluids as if they are infectious. 
Always protect all potential routes of entry, inspect per personal protective equipment before use, and never reuse disposable gloves. Properly decontaminate all exposed items because remember HPV can survive in dry blood for 7 to 10 days. Always make sure you remove any personal protective equipment, especially gloves, in a way so you don't contaminate yourself. Removing them from the inside out is usually the best way. If you do happen to respond to an emergency situation, the most important thing is not to become a victim. Do not touch blood or body fluids without wearing the personal protective equipment and do not give unprotected rescue breathing if it is not necessary. Also remember that the workplace must be kept clean and sanitary. Work surfaces must be decontaminated with an appropriate disinfectant after completion of procedures when surfaces are contaminated and at the end of the work shift. Also remember that all reusable recyclables such as pails and cans that are likely to be contaminated must be inspected and decontaminated on a regular basis at least daily or when visibly contaminated. Now we'll talk about how to clean up a spill. I know this is something that doesn't happen frequently, but is good to know. Always remember to put on personal protective equipment before trying to clean up a spill, restrict the spill, restrict access to that contaminated area. All contaminated and equipment and work areas must be isolated by tape or other type of barrier around the site and also post the appropriate warning signs. Also note that mopping tends to splash and spread fluids around. Instead, use an absorbent first, then collect the materials in a dustpan. Never pick up broken glass or metal scraps with your hands. Use pliers, tongs, or a broom and dustpan and dispose of sharps in the containers provided. The process of cleaning up a spill is to set paper towels or disposable racks over the spill, pour the cleaning solution over the towels, and wipe the spill. If necessary, let the solution sit for up to 10 minutes to decontaminate. Then spray or wet the surface a second time directly with the bleach solution and wipe clean. Finally, rinse with warm water and then spray with a disinfectant material such as Lysol. Also remember to wash exposed items before putting them back in service, washing them with a disinfectant, letting them soak prior to, and rinsing them off. Clean and decontaminate equipment, tools, and the work area as soon as possible. To decontaminate, you can use approved disinfectants or a solution of household bleach and water may be used. For concentrated spills, it is recommended to use a 1 to 10 ratio of bleach to water. We may also have containers with biohazard materials in them. Labels must be predominantly fluorescent orange or orange red with lettering and symbols in contrasting color. The labels are required on containers of regulated waste and on refrigerators and freezers containing blood and other potentially infectious materials and any other containers that are used to store, transport, ship blood, or other potentially infectious materials. However, approved bags or containers can be used instead of labels. If we do have to handle infectious waste, please note that they must go to a designated area where there is only controlled access. Please note to use approved receptacles and that red is the primary color for such containers. We may at times have an exposure incident. An exposure incident is when you contact blood or other potentially infectious materials through broken skin, through the eyes, nose, and mouth, or by a wound such as a needle stick. If exposure happens, you should wash the exposed area with liquid soap and water. Wash the nose, eyes, and mouth for 15 minutes if blood is splashed in mucous membranes. Report the exposure to your supervisor immediately. Determine, if possible, the source of the blood or body fluid and also report this to your supervisor. Seek medical care. This may include antiviral care, hepatitis B shots if needed. The doctor will recommend any treatments or counseling that may be needed depending on the incident. All exposures must be documented on an exposure report. You have to explain what part of the body was exposed, the method of decontamination used, what body fluids were involved, the route of exposure, and if known, the identity of the source of the individual. You also have to describe what personal protective equipment you were wearing and if it failed, how and why. Your incident reports and other records are kept strictly confidential. If there is an exposure incident, please know that hepatitis B shots are offered. You can decline the vaccine. If you do refuse, however, the vaccine can be given out at a later date. 
This vaccine has proven to be safe and effective in preventing